The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. <clears throat> Today is the fifth day of this seven day session here at Mountain Gate, despite the fact that yesterday I thought it was the fifth day. Um, despite the fact that it was going by rather fast. At any rate, today really is the fifth day <clears throat> of this session here at Mountain Gate in Northern New Mexico in March, 2021. And I'd like to continue sharing with you some of the words of Muso Soseki, the eminent monk who was known as a great harmonizer of opposing sides in difficult situations, as well as a beautiful garden designer and a calligraphy, a calligrapher. I don't, I don't know, I had not heard of any of his calligraphies, um, but I assume they are extant still in Japan since calligraphies tend to last a long time, although they have to be cared for in a particular way in Japan because it is so damp and um, the scrolls are rolled up. And so it's, it's a nice hiding place for silverfish and other, other tiny bugs that tend to eat the paper for their sustenance. And so it's customary every spring and every fall to um, bring the scrolls that belong to a temple out into the uh, area where they can get some air <clears throat> and unroll them and uh, let them air out for, for a couple of days. This is before and after the rainy season. And, and then when they're rolled up again, they are rolled up with a kind of powder inside them that uh, technically repels those, those little bugs. Nonetheless, they do tend to uh, make their headway uh, despite that care. Um, I've seen any number of scrolls and in fact, we have at least one here uh, that was given to us um, by the daughter of, of the man uh, whose uh, Zen teacher had given it to her, to him. And they are clearly uh, bug damaged, eaten. Nonetheless, the calligraphies are amazing. And apparently, uh, Muso Soseki was an excellent calligrapher. Calligraphy was big in, in Japanese Buddhism because initially Zen was brought, uh, the teaching of Zen really was brought by Chinese masters who communicated with their Japanese students through uh, the written word. Because in those days, the Chinese written language and the Japanese written language, although pronounced differently, and although, although the Japanese actually had uh, additional characters um, derived from those Chinese characters because the languages, uh, the grammar of the language is very different. It, nonetheless, it was similar enough that they could, they could understand through the written word what, what was being communicated. And so Japanese monks uh, studied calligraphy learn to do calligraphy and then that spread basically into lay people and children in school uh, learn some calligraphy and and by calligraphy i mean using a brush to to write the characters <clears throat> rather than a pencil or a pen and calligraphy is is still rather uh, well studied in Japan. The teacher that I worked with, the second teacher that I worked with, um, was considered a provincial treasure uh, because of the quality of her calligraphy. She was terrific. She was also a wonderful human being and an, and an excellent teacher, a, a really skilled teacher. 
some something that um, any of us who teach, uh, unless we already instinctively know this, uh, could learn from, and that is she would always, uh, after I would do a calligraphy, <clears throat> she would hand me a, a, a what's called a tejon or o tejon in terms of uh, honorifics. And, and um, then I would study it briefly and, and then reproduce it on my own. And then she would take my writing and with her orange ink on her brush, she would um, circle parts of the calligraphy that were, were um, from her perspective, quite good. And this was always the first thing she did. She would always go through and, and indicate a number of places where, where the characters were written well. And then she would um, say, and this one, if you just it would do it a little bit more like this, um, and that's all. So one walked away with a sense that, wow, I can do calligraphy. Sure, there's work I need to do to improve, but but um, it's not it's not not an all or nothing thing, and and she honestly seemed to appreciate uh, where I did it uh, effectively. So anyway, but I've gone astray uh, because of this as well. Uh, the Japanese monks. They don't do it so much anymore, but but uh, in those days, they would also learn to read and write classical Chinese, and uh, any anything that they they wrote in terms of Zen Zen uh, works. Although Hakuin was an exception because he wrote in the the Japanese language vernacular of the time, uh, but monks who did any writing would write in, in the Chinese form. And the tradition of offering a poem on particular occasions uh, was also done as a Chinese style poem. With, uh, so there was a great deal of influence uh, as far as calligraphy in Japanese Zen of Chinese. And particularly in Musoso Seki's era, it was the case. Um, as you recall, Dogen, who preceded Musoso Seki by not long, uh, went to China to work on his practice and came back having had a deep enough awakening that he was able to teach uh, in such with such presence and with such um, effectiveness that uh, his teaching became the Soto sect in Japan. Musou Soseki <clears throat> wrote some, and uh, this particular book that I'm going to share from is Dialogues in, in a Dream, is the translation of the actual title, which is Muchu Mondo. Uh, and if you look closely, I showed this in an earlier day show. Uh, the, the front cover shows a photograph of his portrait statue, light, life-size portrait statue, which is, sits in his uh, founder's room, founder's hall, whatever you want to call it, at Rinzenji which is a, a little temple that is now considered the founder's hall of the big major uh, Rinzai sect headquarter temple, Tenryuji. Tenryuji, by the way, means heavenly dragon temple. And it's one of the major, major Rinzai temples in Japan. It's also, as far as I know, still a teaching temple. It was when I was living in Japan and also when I was visiting Japan after I had been living there as well. Uh, because I used to spend time <clears throat> at Rinzenji and on occasion I would go over to 
to a couple of blocks away to Tenryuji. Dialogues in a dream. It's interesting, we have a, an English uh, children's rhyme, uh, a little song that is uh, sung often. Um, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. One could use that in, in Zen practice. And as a matter of fact, uh, one koan that I had been working on, um, I was able to reproduce that, sing it, and it was the answer to the koan. And I won't tell you what koan it was, but life is a dream. Because we all have different perceptions and our perceptions are all influenced by our history, our experiences, and the conclusions we drew about ourselves and about life as a result of that history and those experiences. So what is the real life? What is real? What is real? This is a big question for Zen students. So let me share a little bit um, on Musoso uh response to a question about precepts, because that is a, a very concerning thing, particularly these days in Western Zen, where there have been some significant abuses of students as a result of misunderstanding of those precepts. So let's see, where are we? So many little stickies here. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> this is Zen and the precepts, and there's a questioner. And most of these questions were given by um, one of his students. Um, and I don't remember whether it was, uh, which of the Ashikaga brothers it was, but uh, one of them and eventually the other as well became his students. And these were the most influential uh, samurai, because they were samurai, uh, in Japanese politics in the era. Uh, the older one became the shogun. He, he made himself shogun, actually, by defeating the emperor um, Go-Daigo. And the younger one uh, was usually, but not always, in support of him. And then, of course, then they would have their disagreements. And sometimes they were quite intense disagreements. And and they would each come to Musou, and he would um, bring harmony about between them, as well as between other people as well. This is called Zen and the Precepts. And the question is, <clears throat> there are those who say that a Mahayana practicer need not necessarily observe the precepts. Is this correct? And actually, this is an excuse given by uh, some of the people in high position in Zen in, in the West who have abused their students. An incomplete understanding of practice. And Musso answers, the teachings of the Buddhas are infinite. Yet all of them are contained within the three disciplines, the, the precepts, meditation, and wisdom. These three disciplines are inherent in the one mind, that's capital one, capital mind of sentient beings. Thus, if one penetrates to the source of this one mind, which is very deep, this is not superficial Zen. This is not Zen after one or two or three Kensho. This is far deeper than that.
Thus, if one penetrates to the source of this one mind, one attain, attains all of the marvelous virtues of the three disciplines. It is like obtaining the mani, the wish-fulfilling jewel that manifests all other treasures. Therefore, the investigation of the source of the one mind is the essence of Mahayana practice. And there you have the fundamental con of our Zen school. What is the source of this mind? And what is this mind for that matter? Earlier, he speaks about uh, the illusion of separate minds, the real mind and the fake mind, or the intellectual mind and the mind of practice, or however else one might want to try to differentiate. This one mind. And as the Korean master Chino said, turn the light inward and trace it down to the source. Again, this is, this is exactly what we're doing in Zen practice, or it's what we're supposed to be doing, let's put it that way. And of course, we are uh, dealing with all the habit patterns of thinking and assuming and self-criticism and all the rest along the way. But what we're reaching for is the source of that mind with a capital M, which is what we are. Therefore, the investigation of the source of the one mind is the essence of Mahayana practice. This is what is meant when it is said that the form of the precepts need not necessarily be observed. The Nirvanish Sutra says, observing the precepts consists of diligent application to the practice of the Mahayana. And then he qualifies it. Nevertheless, it is wrong to say that the Mahayana practicers need not keep the precepts. Since the time of the Tathagata, the Buddha, and needless to say, during his lifetime as well, the teachers of doctrine and meditation who have spread his dharma have all fully maintained the precepts. While the Buddha was alive, there were no such things as meditation monks, scholastic monks, and precept monks, distinguished by appearance and dress. Externally, they all behaved in accordance with the rules of conduct and deportment, while internally, they all cultivated meditation and wisdom. And there's a tradition of uh, repentance ceremonies that has come down from the time of the Buddha. They were traditionally held, and still in uh, traditional Asian Buddhist countries, they are still held uh, at the new moon and the full moon. And at those times, everyone in the monastery gathers and takes a look inward to see where they have behaved in less than optimal ways, less than enlightened ways. And they speak up about it. They confess to these, these uh, misbehaviors, this dysfunction, before the other monks and nuns. And of course, it, it is imperative when we do that, which we all do before taking the precepts, that we further, we don't just say, you know, I did this and, and I'm, I'm sorry about it. I shouldn't have done it or whatever. We also say, I vow not to repeat it. And we make a distinct commitment to not continuing to indulge in whatever that negative behavior pattern was. Now, as we go through our deepening practice, that becomes a much easier thing both to recognize and to be able to shift into positive behavior. 
And I should add this too, that um, there is enormous value <clears throat> in being straightforward and honest about behavior that we should not have been indulging in publicly. In other words, to confess publicly what you have been doing that's not so great. When I first was at the Rochester Zen Center, these uh, repentance ceremonies were held every month, uh, and in particular before a sashin. The idea being, and uh, I think effectively so, that if you could let go of concern about negative behavior by offering it up, confessing to it, and vowing to not do it again, that you, you would enter Sashin with a much more clear and effective mind of practice. And in those days, I can tell you I hated them. Uh, I'm not sure anybody else did either. And often the so-called confessions were rather superficial. But then as people matured in their practice, they began to see the benefit of honestly examining ourselves and honestly in opening before our, our brothers and sisters in the Sangha about what we'd been doing that wasn't so good. And these were short, you know, we're not meant to write a great novel about this. Uh, you, you confessed a, a, a sort of an executive summary of what you had been doing and indicate, indicated your remorse and your regret and vowed not to do it again. And in this way, it became a very effective and very positive aspect of practice. Nevertheless, it is wrong to say that Mahayana practitioners need not keep the precepts since the time of the Tathagata, and needless to say, during his lifetime as well, the teachers of doctrine and meditation who have spread his dharma have all fully maintained the precepts. I'm not sure. Well, this is centuries ago that he's speaking. Uh, it's not quite as uh, positive in more recent times, unfortunately. While the Buddha was alive, there were no such things as meditation monks, scholastic monks, and precept monks distinguished by appearance and dress. Externally, they all behaved in accordance with the rules of conduct and deportment, while internally, they all cultivated meditation and wisdom. In the present latter-day age of the Dharma, however, those able to combine all three disciplines are rare. So it is not unreasonable that the followers of the respective disciplines would divide into distinct schools. It is mistaken, however, for each school to criticize the others, insisting that the discipline it focuses on is first in importance. In the Sutra for Resolving Doubts during the age of the semblance Dharma, the Buddha says, in the latter age of the Dharma, meditation monks, scholastic monks, and precept monks will separate from one another and eventually destroy my Dharma with their mutual condemnations. They are like parasites in a lion who eat away at his flesh. Though such monks retain ego attachments from having failed to extinguish their deluded passions, how are even such as they able to call themselves disciples of the Buddha and still transgress the rules laid down by him? Buddhism first entered China at the time of Emperor Ming of the later Han Dynasty. At that time, and for several centuries thereafter, the appearance of the monks was much as it is as it was at the time of the Buddha. From the time of the Tang Dynasty, Master Daizi of Baizong, however, Zen monks started to live apart from Vinaya temples. And Vinaya is the precept uh, code of behavior. 
They established their own monasteries and followed rules of conduct different from those of the Vinaya monks. Baizong explained these developments by saying, in the latter age of Dharma, people's capacities are dull and they're unable to simultaneously follow all three disciplines of precepts, meditation, and wisdom. If they reside in Vinaya temples, practicers of med meditation can get so involved in learning the minutiae of the precepts, and there are literally hundreds of precepts that are part of the Vinaya, that they forget the one great purpose of the Buddha. Thus, I have established a separate monastery for meditation. Essentially, the Vinaya precepts <clears throat> began during the time of the Buddha, whenever there was some kind of infraction uh, among the Sangha, uh, there would be a precept written to help people understand not to do it again. And gradually these mounted up. Uh, there are various different calculations of how many there are. Uh, <clears throat> for women, there are over 500. And uh, for men, there are less, which says something about the culture of the times. And some of them are, they were most likely practical at the time of the Buddha. And they do uh, express a certain uh, outlook on the, on the culture of the times because there are a number of them that don't necessarily make sense in our modern culture. One of them, for example, there is a precept um, that is uh, delicately put not to excrete on green herbage. That means don't shit on the grass. It's an odd thing to have a precept about not shitting on the grass in modern uh, Western countries, at least where we have toilets and where the only time we would shit on the grass would be if we were hiking and camping. And then, of course, <clears throat> there are not really alternatives. And anyway, uh, you take care of it in appropriate ways. So it doesn't seem like in modern American Buddhism, there needs to be such a precept. Uh, the story behind this establishment of the precept was that apparently, a group of nuns were um, living near a park and every new moon and full moon, which is uh, sort of the weekends in countries that observe the lunar calendar, uh, the local folk would come and enjoy being in the park and they'd have parties and they'd sing and they kids would run around shrieking and all the kinds of things that people do in parks. And the nuns were, highly annoyed because they felt that all this noise and all this commotion was interfering with their practice. And so they decided to make the park so unpleasant nobody'd come. And so they went out and they pooped in the peed and they desecrated the, the park. And that's where that precept comes from. I don't think most people in America would do that unless they are mentally ill. And, and so one wonders about that precept. And there are some others that are uh, quite similar in terms of whether they would really be make sense in modern society. But when the Buddha was on, on his deathbed, <clears throat> he was asked, what do we do about the precepts? And he said, well, keep the ones that are important and let the rest of them go. And because the elders could not decide which ones were important and which ones could be let go, they kept them all. And so the Vinaya monks and nuns have a, a great burden of, in some cases, very uh, mismatched in terms of their current culture, rules to go by. I learned about these precepts. We studied these precepts in a uh, conference of Western ordained Buddhist women 
that I attended for almost a month at Bodh Gaya in India in 1996. Uh, Sozri Sensei was with me at the time. She had just gotten ordained uh, the previous October, and this was in February. And it was rather wonderful to go to a warm country in February from Japan, although we both got quite ill. Uh, nonetheless, it was a very, very interesting window on traditional Asian Buddhist culture. It was most of the women there were of Tibetan practice, and they were mostly uh, Americans or Europeans. There were three Theravadan nuns, and at the time there was a great big uh, brouhaha about whether Theravadan women uh, were legitimate as nuns. <clears throat> Nonetheless, these women, one of whom was French, and, and there was an Australian woman, I remember the third one. And uh, we all gathered together. And at one point, after studying these precepts for three weeks, both uh, taught by a Chinese abbess and as well by a, a, a Tibetan practice man, I, trying to think if he was Tibetan or if he was Nepali or something. Uh, I don't think he was Nepali. I think he was Tibetan, uh, Rinpoche. And I asked these other women, I said, do you keep all of these precepts? And I thought, well, I'm never gonna be able to go, to go camping again if I have to uh, observe all of them. And they said, no. So my thought then was, well, then why do you commit to take to uh, honoring them? Why do you commit to keeping them when you're not even planning to do that? Up until that time, I had planned to go to Taiwan and, and take the full ordination. Uh, Japanese ordination is not considered the full ordination uh, by Chinese, but what happened in Japan was at a certain point, uh, what are known as the Bodhisattva precepts were instituted in place of the Vinaya precepts. And the Bodhisattva precepts, which we take up as koans and in the latter part of our koan practice in Rinzai Zen are wonderful expressions of a deep abiding truth involving precepts. And they're, they're far deeper and far, um, well, let's just say they're far deeper than the Vinaya precepts. The Vinaya precepts are really rules of behavior, uh, ordinary behavior. The Bodhisattva precepts are expressions of how a fully enlightened human being would naturally behave. And so when we do ordinations at Mountain Gate or Hidden Valley Zen Center or Turtleback Zendo, uh, these are done with the, with the Bodhisattva precepts because this is typical of Japanese Zen now. And having studied the Vinaya precepts, I can certainly support that as a, as a more optimal way to express precepts and to commit to doing, uh, behaving in accord with precepts. So to continue what Ms. Sososeki says, Though such monks retain ego attachments from having failed to extinguish their deluded passions, how are even such as they able to call themselves disciples of the Buddha and still transgress the rules laid down by him? Buddha, Buddhism first entered China at the time of Emperor Ming of the latter Han dynasty. At that time and for several centuries thereafter, the appearance of the monks was much as it was at the time of the Buddha. 
From the time of the Tang Dynasty, Master Zazi of Baizang, however, Zen monks started to live apart from Vinaya temples, and you heard what he had said about that. Baizang did not intend that Zen monks should not maintain the precepts. Indeed, in his pure rule for monastic life, he explains in great detail the code of conduct proper to monks of the meditation tradition. As we go more and more deeply into our practice and our vision in essence becomes more and more clear, we become more and more aware of when our behavior is not really in accord with compassion and wisdom. And we have a choice to deny it and shove it under the carpet, pretend it doesn't exist, in which case it will rule us from behind the curtain, so to speak. <clears throat> or we can take it to heart and feel the remorse at the blooming awareness of behaving in ways that are not the way we would like to behave. And then what opens up is the possibility of letting that behavior go through the felt sense and, and simply through the act of recognizing it and owning it because it weakens the connections in the brain that would otherwise keep it hidden and keep it uh, active. And it's so much easier not to indulge in those behaviors then because it's almost as if, as you've heard before, there's, there's like a stop sign or a flashing red light that pops up when you would almost start to do it again. And there's a sense of, do you really want to do that again? Or would you really rather not cause that suffering? And so we become more and more able to, uh, to live in accord with the precepts. And I'm not talking about Vinaya precepts, rules of behavior here. I'm talking about the deeper uh, Bodhisattva precepts. And as we continue our Zen practice, we continue to become more aware. And again, we have increasing chances to make a choice between continuing the behavior by um, dissociating from it, denying that, it, that it's been happening, or we can let it go and uh, no longer indulge in it. And then also, when we take the precepts, uh, and here we do the Bodhisattva precepts, of course, uh, then each time we commit to uh, keeping these precepts, which we do during these ceremonies, it, it helps to sink it deeper in our psyche. And then as we deepen our practice to the point where we are able to eventually work on the precept cons, we gain even greater understanding of what they really mean and our behavior naturally by that time would continue to accord. Assuming we have done our practice and this really depends on the teacher and the level of commitment the teacher has to really um, bringing forth the best in people, helping them realize truly who they really are. That level of practice is not for everybody, but for the few it is for, to find a teacher who is committed to that depth of practice and that level of practice 
is, uh, well, it's imperative in a way, and it's rare. To come upon Buddhist practice alone is rare. Even in this day and age where uh, it's all over the place. And here I'm talking about true Buddhist practice because there's a lot of Zen light offered all over the world. And uh, I don't mean to denigrate it because it, it has its role. Chogyam Trumpa established uh, the Shambhala system for people who were not quite yet ready to do the hardcore Tibetan Buddhist practice. And the entry level practice is, is important to make available. So it's pretty terrific that there are those options in the United States. It's also very interesting that the Europeans seem to be far more dedicated to practice than Americans seem to be. And it perhaps is a result of the fact that they have had tremendous amount of suffering in their countries. Two world wars and uh, in the Iron Curtain uh, countries in, in Europe, uh, the iron hand of Stalin and, and hardcore communist control. Many, many people have suffered. And it's recent enough that they haven't really forgotten it, despite the fact that there are Holocaust deniers. In America, we've had a sort of a halcyon existence. And unless there's something deep within us that is driving our practice, for many people, why bother? And so to have a, a, a more uh, easygoing, uh, I really don't like to say Zen light because that is uh, pejorative, but uh, a lighter way of doing practice uh, that people can use as entry into practice and then perhaps catch fire and find a, a place later on that would do a, a deeper level of practice. Uh, but to start somewhere is, is so important because it makes such a difference when you do Zen practice and particularly when you begin to see the results of it in your own life in greater ease, in the arising of uh, much greater, deeper compassion and wisdom of the bodhicitta, which is the desire to come to awakening for the benefit of all beings, not for me, but to relieve suffering wherever it can be relieved. And that is a byproduct of deep Zazen, of ongoing deep Zen practice. So I think that's enough for today, but here we are in the fifth day of practice, uh, intensive practice that is Sashin. And uh, going deeper is what it's about taking advantage of this period of time when, when it is offered, these sashin, even though we offer them pretty much almost every month. Uh, still, it's not that easy to take time out of your life. Some of you are only able to come some days of the sashin. Even to come for one day is so helpful. Depending, of course, on the commitment you put into it. And that's the other thing. You can do a whole seven days and treat it like Zen light, even though the option is very deeper Zazen. And I know people who have done that. I know one man who in Rochester 
Uh, and I can say that he, he didn't stick around very long. Um, he went through an entire Sashin. His aim in the Sashin was to stay awake the entire seven days. And he did manage that. But he managed that by uh, coming up with a lot of inner stories, uh, very, very um, delightful inner, inner stories to entertain himself. Uh, the practice, he did not do the practice. So it boils down to us as well, each one of us committing deeply to the practice. And we often have to commit again and again and again and again. And as I said yesterday, the only reason I stuck it out in the early days, now I stick it out because I can't do anything else. The, the, the uh, experience has been so profound that I, I wouldn't give it up for anything. And I, I certainly yearn to continue deepening it. But the only reason I, I did start and did stick it out in the early days when it was dreadful was because I knew there was nothing else that I would be able to do that would bring me lasting happy, happiness. And I had had enough experience in life because I was in my early 30s when I first started doing Zen practice. I think I was 32. And had been through enough um, pain that I, I, I knew that there wasn't anything outside that was going to make a positive difference. And that the only way to truly become free and that freedom, of course, included being able to be there for others who were suffering in some positive way that would help relieve that suffering. The only way to do that was to, to go into Zen practice and to go into it with 100% commitment. Sometimes it felt like I had no commitment at all, but somehow it was there underground because now it's been more than 40 years. So I hope for each one of you, it will be the same, that you'll feel deeply drawn to this practice because it offers nothing short of total liberation and the ability with that increasing liberation to live a life that is one that will benefit all living beings. So thank you for listening. Sorry you went so, uh, for so long, but um, keep it going.